Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. This series was made possible through the generosity of Satellite Healthcare, and we thank them for their support. My name is Melanie Paris, and I'm the Senior Director of Health Initiatives and Education here at the American Kidney Fund. Before I turn the presentation over to today's speaker, I'd like to direct your attention to the control panel you should see on your screen. All participants are on mute, so we won't hear you, but we welcome your questions. If you have a question, please type it into the section of your control panel titled questions. We'll see your questions and we'll do our best to answer them either by replying to you in the questions box or out loud during the last several minutes of the presentation. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available for viewing on our website, kidneyfunds.org slash webinars within the next one to two weeks. Those of you in attendance who are health professionals, we are glad that you've joined us today and hope you'll recommend this webinar to the patients you work with. However, as a friendly reminder, this webinar is not accredited for continuing education credits and you will not receive a, a certificate upon completion. If you believe that your accrediting body may offer your, you credits for attending this webinar, we'll be happy to send you a certificate of attendance after today's session. Simply email us at education at kidneyfund.org. So without further ado, let me introduce today's speaker, Dr. Paul Bennett. Dr. Paul Bennett is an honorary professor at Deakin University, Melbourne, Australia, and currently the Director of Medical and Clinical Affairs at Satellite Healthcare Incorporated USA. Paul's recent research has focused on strategies to improve the quality of life of people with chronic and end-stage kidney disease using laughter therapy, resistance and aerobic exercise, home dialysis e-learning, communication techniques, imagery, and workforce models. Paul was the foundation editor-in-chief of the Renal Society of Australasia Journal and editor-in-chief for 10 years. Thank you, Dr. Bennett, for joining us. It's a pleasure, Melanie. Thank you for the lovely introduction. Um, I wonder if we get the next slide, please. And the next one, because you know all about me, and that was a quick photo. Um, before we start, it's really important to know the expertise of, of the webinar audience and who we're talking to and who's dialed in. So, uh, first of all, I wonder if you could do a short poll on what best describes you. Um, you can choose more than one in the poll, um, but the poll options are I have kidney disease but not on dialysis yet, I'm on dialysis or have a transplant, I have a friend, loved one, I'm a, a nephrology health professional, I'm a non-nephrology health professional. And if you don't fit in one of those, very happy for you just to quickly type in in the chat box. Um, what you would describe yourself. So you might be a laughter therapist or you might be a medical student or a nursing student. So I'll give you another five seconds for that. If we can close the poll, thanks, Ashley. Okay, so we've got 81% nephrology health professionals, 10% non-nephrology health professionals and some consumers and some um, some dialysis and kidney disease experts who who hopefully can provide some uh, questions and some input and maybe some feedback down the track because uh, those who are on dialysis uh, are really the professionals, the experts. Sorry, on, on what it's like to be on dialysis. Um, we've got another sh very short poll um, for you, and I'd like to. Um, now we know who's out there. I wonder if I could rate your we could rate your happiness right now. So happy, how happy are you right now? Well, a poll will come up now, and I would wonder if you could choose a number that represents how happy you are right now. So one is very, very unhappy, and five is as happy as you could possibly be. It's very scientific, uh, a very scientific thing. We won't publish this. It's okay, although it will come up potentially on the, on the recording, but anonymously. Okay, that's probably enough time. Let's see how happy everyone is. <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> About medium. I'm a bit concerned uh, if anyone's from uh, international uh, and running internationally, it might be four o'clock in the morning and they might be very happy right now. So um, uh, so we're looking at three or four. So that would 
rate to about in between 60 to 80 percent happiness. Um, if we could have the next slide, thanks, Ashley. It's, uh, it's an interesting, um, an interesting little uh, thing we do. Our next slide. So we actually ask question, ask that question to hemodialysis patients. Um, how happy you are on a scale of actually 0 to 100. And if you see those two bar graphs on the right hand side, um, you'll note that the hemodialysis population in red rated themselves approximately 60 out of 100, which if you compare that to your poll that you just did, was three out of five. And if you can see the, uh, the black, which is non-dialysis people, so that's uh, aged matched population, um, so we're matching the red with the black on ages, and that was for non dialysis so people who just happened to fill in this survey, and they're almost up to 80, which is equivalent to four out of five. So it's interesting uh, uh, what our feedback is, and, and we can make that uh, what it is. Next slide, please. What we're going to talk about today, and what we've already talked about, is the unhappiness of people and, and the bleakness of what dialysis can be, um, and a little bit about um, the inactivity of people in dialysis, laughter therapy in healthcare, laughter in dialysis, and the program that, that we've set out, which is Laugh Out Loud Hemodialysis, or we've called it LOLHD because we want to be hip and trendy by calling it something with an abbreviation of LOL. I've been very lucky to be involved in laughter in dialysis in both Australia, you can tell by my accent, and I apologise if I use an Australian term or if I use some slang that might, uh, that might, and you may want to put in the chat box if I use a t an Australian term that you may not understand. Um, but uh, we're also being lucky enough to be involved in, in laughter therapy and dialysis in the US as well, and you'll see examples of that. Next slide. This is what we would all love to be like, and this is what we would love our patients to be like, but unfortunately that's not the case. Next slide. The physical inactivity of, uh, in dialysis is quite stark. Um, we, a study was done that showed um, that we put accelerom accelerom accelerometers excuse me, on patients um, and on non-dialysis uh, people, and you can see the line at the top clearly demonstrates those non-dialysis patients who walk more than those uh, who are on dialysis. So at 30 years old, um, and you, you can see the bottom axis, the horizontal axis, which is at age in years, at 30 years old, the gap is a bit, but not too bad. But as you go across your horizontal axis to the age of 70, you can see the gap between activity of non-dialysis and dialysis people is gets, gets larger and larger and larger. So this represents uh, the fact that people are physically inactive, and particularly the longer and longer they are on dialysis. Next slide, please. And when we compare people with end-stage renal disease, or ESRD, to those in other chronic diseases, you'll notice that people report lower activity um, than, than almost all other chronic conditions. So that, that uh, red uh, the, the red highlight there of ESRD patients, they rated themselves lower on the SF36 physical composite score as compared to those people with limited use of arms and legs, chronic heart failure, chronic angina, diabetes, chronic lung disease, arthritis, high blood pressure, even cancer and, and depression. This shows that people with kidney disease on dialysis are in fact one of the lowest physically active groups that, that we have. Interestingly, um, this, uh, this activity, similar to the last slide, people report themselves uh, uh, less active as they get older. But interestingly, when we when looked at the, the mental health side of things, is that that doesn't deteriorate as, as they get older. Next slide, please. Now, this physical deterioration has a whole lot of aspects and elements to it, but clearly, um, kidney disease and comorbidities such as diabetes, hypertension, things that people have to deal with um, clearly decrease the amount of, uh, of exercise that people do. Sitting for 12 hours per week on dialysis certainly doesn't help, but most importantly we found that the, the restrictions that patients have to undertake, fluid, diet restrictions, the amount of tablets they have to take leads to decreased physical social outings. All of these three put together lead to that uh, gross inactivity. 
Next slide. And we've measured the decrease in this by a, fu a physical function test. And if you get bored with this webinar, you can do this test uh, within the next hour, as long as you've got to make sure that your, your chair that you're sitting on is quite steady, because I don't want people falling off and, and, uh, and hurting themselves. The functional test that we do that's, uh, that shows, um, that, that measures pretty much the physical function of patients, um, we ask them to see how many times they can sit and stand on from a chair over 30 seconds. They can't use their hands to, to push off. They have to have their hands, as that man has shown, across their tummy or across their chest. Now, if you went and did this now, most of you are non-dialysis people, so you would be able to do 20 to 30. If you're young and fit, you would do over 30 sit to stands in 30 seconds. Um, the average dialysis patient can do 10. So clearly, um, the muscles that are used for getting up core and, and quad muscles for getting out of a chair are, uh, are decreased, the function is decreased. We track these patients over a period of 24 weeks and you can see that box plots from the left to the right um, going down from an average of 10 to an average of 8. Um, and, and you can see that it's a fairly wide group, but this is 220 patients we followed um, through that time, through a six month period, where the same patients, their mean sit to stands was deteriorating significantly. Next slide. Another poll, just to make sure that you're still with us. Um, how often do you do 30 minutes or more of exercise? Every day? Uh, wait till the poll comes up. Greater than three times per week? One to three days per week, or never. We'll see how active our group is. Okay, I think we should be done. Well, let's see. Uh, Let's see uh, what we do. I'm probably talking to the converted. Often people who, who are interested in these sorts of um, aspects are, are, are pretty active as well. So that's great and that's terrific. Uh, and if you're all dialysis patients, of course, the, the never and the one to three days per week would be the, the, would be the highest scoring. Okay, next. Often people ask me um, what the best exercise to do is for people on dialysis or for people receiving dialysis. And they say, well, should it be resistance exercise uh, or should it be cardiovascular exercise? The fellow on the left is actually uh, doing some quad pushes on uh, a weights machine. You can't actually see that. And the fellow on the right is, is, is doing just a, has a, has a stationary bike wheeled up to him and is doing exercise. And many of you would be involved, particularly in, with, with groups who have, uh, have done the, uh, the bike exercises. Now, what is better? Well, they're both good because they're actually in aerobic. In resistance exercise, you do a bit of cardiovascular. In cardiovascular, there is also a strength and resistance element. So, so they're both good. And if, I were, if you were to ask me that question, I would say a combination of both would be great. Next slide. So there are exercise programs going on around the world. Singapore, they have exercise physiologists who come in and do lots of work. Next slide. In the United Kingdom, um, there's a lot of work being done through the NHS, but also there are some groups in particular Leicester who do some really great stuff and that's a, a specially modified um, cycle for dialysis work. Next slide. Uh, the Swedes, they always try to push the envelope with trying to do things. I love the, the top right hand picture there, a fellow's doing home training on dialysis, but he's also decided to, uh, to get on a bike and do, some, and do some exercises as well. And in my native Australia, um, we don't hopefully let dialysis, uh, and particularly peritoneal dialysis, stop, stop what we're doing. So for favourite exercise in, in Australia, as many men around the world love, is, is, uh, is fishing, and, uh, and you can see this guy is uh, having his PD drained in while he's actually um, fishing at the same time. And he's still with us, he's actually had a transplant, it's, a, it's been a great story. Next slide. This is a bit, bit of another picture of the of the dialysis resistance machine that uh, that's been developed. So you basically it's like a gym equipment machine which you wheel around and uh, and you put in front of patients and they can do all sorts of all sorts of exercises. There is also one being developed by a colleague in in Adelaide, Australia, who which has hand attachments as well, so you can do arm exercises as well. And resistance exercises certainly. Um, uh, have a great improvement and it's trying to show great improvement for patients on dialysis. Next slide. The resistance bands are, are a, 
Um, although they don't have the same force and weight as what weights do, they are, I think, an excellent choice when it comes to people on dialysis. The resistance bands, you can still get a very good workout from them. Um, you can clean them, they're cheap, you can put patients' names on them, they can actually sit in their lockers and, and or, or sit in their boxes or their baskets, whatever, whatever you have in your dialysis clinic. You can see this guy has actually, he does all these exercises by himself, and you can see him, he's attached his own belt from his trousers to the back of the chair, attached the TheraBand, and he's doing some shoulder exercises with the TheraBand, which is uh, yeah, some of the things that, that people uh, develop in these programs are amazing. Next slide. We um, used the TheraBands in a, in a, a research program that, uh, that lasted for 12 months using 200 patients in 15 Melbourne dialysis clinics. So we had band exercises, we had physical therapists, and our primary outcome was that 30 second sit to stand test. Next slide. And you'll notice, although this is a fairly detailed slide, um, is that on the x-axis at the bottom, that's uh, the week, so it goes up in three monthly increments, week 0, week 12, week 24, week 36, and week 48. The vertical y-axis on the, on the left-hand side there is the amount of sit stands that, that um, each patient does. We divided the patients, these 200 patients, into three groups of approximately 70, and in the first week 0 to week 12, uh, we did not do any exercise whatsoever. And you can see them deteriorate from 10 to 8, which is very similar to that, that graph I showed you before. We got the 70 patients from group 1 who are in blue, and we started an exercise program with these TheraBands. And you can see how uh, they, their sit to stands have improved from, uh, from 8 and a half or so um, up to above 10. And that has kept going uh, up because they had that intervention from week 12 to week 48. The red group over the first 24 weeks did not do any exercise. Um, as soon as they started the TheraBand exercise, you can see uh, that, that movement up again. So their sit to stands went from 8 to 9 to 10 over the next six month period or the next 24 week period. And this green group, we didn't do any exercise for 36 weeks. They kept deteriorating with their mean sit to stands. And then in the last three months when they were doing this exercise training, uh, they uh, went up at least one and a half sit to stand. So we were very happy that um, a resistance exercise with exercise physiologists, and that was the important, or exercise professionals, they're also called kinesiologists, EPs, physical therapists. A physical exercise professional is required because as nurses and as technicians, it's very difficult to, to do this without this exercise expertise. Next slide. So who would have thought that the patient, such as this patient, uh, would also be hopefully um, throwing, her, throwing her frame away? This lady actually said to me she can get out of bed, uh, sorry, she's not get out of bed, she can get out of her car um, a lot better than, uh, than what she used to, so, and by herself. Next slide. So this, this has led to some resources, and these resources are available on kidney.org.au, so there's an exercise. Uh, an exercise box so you can have an exercise manual and some a DVD. Next slide. And there are these that you can download if you want to do these exercises. And there are videos that, that, that show the exercise being done. Next slide. Okay. All right. So what is uh, laughter all about? And, um, and, and laughter as a form of exercise, is it actually possible? Because remember, exercise is something that, uh, that a lot of people don't like and a lot of people find it difficult. Um, and can we put some laughter into this exercise? Well, we did some, uh, some trials in, in Australia and um, rather than me describe them, I'd like to show you a video um, about uh, laughter as a form of exercise in a dialysis clinic. We'd like to run the video now. People on dialysis uh, spend five hours uh, a day, three times a week um, in the dialysis uh, unit. They spend a lot of their time and we wanted to make, first of all, make their lives a little bit a little bit happier and a little bit better. But more importantly, we wanted to look at some of the physiological changes that might occur. So what we're doing is measuring lung function, we're measuring uh, immunity and we're measuring other biochemical parameters to see if laughter has any effect. Relax the jaw as well. 
So relax, jaw with a smile. It looks a bit weird, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Just lost the director of nursing. <laughs> Essentially it's like laboratory laughter, um, it's because a lot of people don't have the opportunities to laugh um, all the time and you know often it's especially in those moments where you feel like laughing the least is where you actually need to laugh the most. It's a big improvement you know, on attitude, you know, you come and you are always, why me, why me, you know, you are down when you do five uh, hours dialysis three times a week, it's hard on the body, but laughter like that, oh, it improves you, you know. We're really challenging that whole notion of, of what laughter is because, you know, we're brought up that laughter is very much, you know, a humour response, whereas we're just walk, working with that raw nature of laughter um, for laughter's sake to create those same results. There's just something about when you give into the process and really put your body, your whole body into a state of laughter, it's not just from the head but the whole body, um, there's a real shift in the mind into thinking wow this is great and the whole physiology of the body changes as well so the, the blood pressure goes up, the oxygen gets to the cells of the body and if people are down they get energised and if people are up they get relaxed so it actually works from both ends, it's quite profound. We think that uh, the measures of anxiety and, and the measures of mood uh, may be better. We actually have a measure of happiness which is called subjective well-being and we think that that's improving over a period of four weeks but we still have to look at the data a bit closer. In some cases people have found the laugh yoga to be very very beneficial to helping in some way be it emotionally, mentally or physically. So we don't call ourselves a, an alternative therapy, we call ourselves a complementary therapy in addition to whatever other things you're doing to help the body heal. Very good for the patient. They, they live longer, and make a happy, happier life. You feel better. The circulation gets better. And that's, uh, I enjoy it. I really do enjoy it. Okay, so now you've seen that video, it's interesting um, that the type of laughter that you saw was actually intentional laughter, which is the, the last um, type of laughter. Um, on this slide. So people were laughing on purpose, but as you notice, the laughter was on purpose, but it became a natural laughter. Um, the laughter that we saw, uh, we started and we promoted, but in fact, people were laughing and staff and both patients were laughing. And so that's a, a, an example of, of laughter therapy and intentional laughter at its best. But there are other types of laughter and you'd be familiar with the spontaneous laughter, which is a joke. And you know you might go to a comedy uh, a comedy uh, um, presentation and you might laugh a lot, but in general jokes only last for a certain short period of time and then you stop laughing again. Um, induced laughing or laughing gas, we all know that from our uh, dental procedures and in fact um, that is another form of, of, of laughter. Pathological laughter is a very rare form and it's usually caused by trauma to the brain, but there have been cases where people haven't, even, haven't been able to stop laughing similar to not being able to stop sneezing or coughing um, caused by some sort of brain injury. And there's the stimulated laughter, which I can't do across the webinar, unfortunately. We can't all tickle each other, but that's another form of laughter. And maybe in dialysis units, we might get thrown out if we start tickling our patients. So the intentional laughter is the laughter that we use in laughter therapy and laughter yoga. So as a summary of this laughter therapy that we do in, in dialysis consists of controlled breathing, uh, relaxation techniques, um, clapping, some deep breathing exercises, and some uh, neck and shoulder stretches that they can do on dialysis, the limb exercises that you did see on the video, facilitated laughter and smile exercises. So it's a combination of intentional laughter, yogic breathing and exercises. That's what it's all about. Next slide. What I'd like you to do now is to um, do a warm-up exercise, which is what we do, and it also shows you the, the therapeutic breathing and, and what actually happens during when we laugh. So if you put your hand on your stomach, your right hand on your stomach, you take a big breath through your nose and hold for three seconds. And then breathe out. 
and you'll feel uh, the muscles in your in your uh, in your diaphragm working. And what laughter is is just an, it's a a deep a deep diaphragmatic exercise. So laughing actually exaggerates that normal breathing exercise, so you get a, a diaphragmatic. Uh, and in fact, you do get a core workout. And the second thing you can do is put your hand flat on your chest and go and you say ha 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 similar to laughing and you might start laughing as well and you can generally keep the you can generally hear the the um uh, uh the and feel the air going through your chest similarly you could place your index finger and thumb around your windpipe and say he 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 and you can actually feel the air flowing up through your windpipe as well So following this study that you saw that was uh, related to the video and the laughter therapy that we did in, in Australia, um, you know, we, we saw lots of benefits that, that really reflect the benefits of laughter therapy in general population. And there have been a lot of studies done on laughter therapy um, where they've shown that they've been improved cardiovascular health, improved lung function, improved immune system. Certainly there's a, a certain lymph lymphatic uh, um, effect uh, when you do laugh. There's a decreased pain and some improved mental health studies as well. Next slide. One of the studies that may be more applicable to dialysis patients because we have a lot of people who, are, who have diabetes is a study where we did a laughter exercise study and uh, we looked at the HPA1Cs um, which decreased in the intervention group from 5.2 to 5.4. The delayed treatment, which was the control group, went from 5 uh, to 5.07, so it actually went up the wrong way. So it was certainly it trended in the right direction. It wasn't particularly significant, only had small numbers, but it was a, it was a, a, a good sign that laughter exercise may have some effect on HbA1c. Next slide. The, the test we did in in the Australian study, uh, where we asked basically were um, they were there was the happiness increased or were they feeling better, um, and did their anxiety and stress decrease? And you can see the right hand columns um, where those numbers that we originally talked about, where dialysis patients were lower than the regular population, then that went from 70, and then the red line is the red column is after one month of therapy, so they certainly improved on the question, how are you feeling right now, from a scale of naught to 100. Similarly, their anxiety on the left-hand side went down and their stress went down also. Next slide. Some of the unexpected results, which we couldn't really, uh, we really didn't expect, was that um, uh, there was a decrease in the episodes of low blood pressure, so interdialytic hypotension decreased from some mechanism. Um, interestingly, there were no changes in post blood pressures afterwards, so even though there were less intradilytic hypotensive episodes, we didn't really have a change in post blood pressure. Not that we can really gain anything from post blood pressures because often they're all, all over the place. We certainly did um, lung function tests during uh, the treatment and following the treatment just to make sure that we weren't um, causing any lung distress for any of the patients and, and there was certainly no change, which was a, which was a good outcome. Uh, we didn't see an increase in intradilytic uh, uh, symptoms such as cramps or any uh, vascular access problems. And when we asked the patients and the dialysis staff, they all certainly thought it had a positive impact on the patients. Next. But that's the, our Australian experience. And many of you um, on the webinar are from the United States and when we thought about bringing this to um, American dialysis clinics, people said, well, you know, where are you going to get the laughter therapists? What's, you know, American clinics are a lot different. And yeah, that, that was potentially right. So um, what we did is uh, we, first of all, we, we looked for, um, uh, for laughter therapies and we found that there are laughter communities all over the United States, similar to all over the world. Next slide. And if you and keep clicking and you will find a laughter club or a laughter yoga therapy club in nearly every uh, part of the America where if you're a big enough uh, community and even some of the smaller communities there are certainly laughter clubs. Laughter, wherever there's a dialysis unit, I can be pretty sure that there'll be a, a laughter therapist close by. 
and this has been my experience and I think the experience of, of many other people who are looking for laughter as a therapy to improve um, the care of or either their patients or, or even themselves. What's a better example though is if, uh, if I show you the video of the laughter therapy sessions that, uh, that we had in, in two, uh, uh, two laughter therapy um, pilot studies um, in California. If you'd like to roll the video now, thank you. This is Satellite Healthcare's Sacramento Hemodialysis Center. On a typical day, the center's expert medical team cares for their patients whose kidneys have failed as a machine filters toxins from their blood. It's a process that takes three to four hours, three times a week. For patients, the hours drag on. Thankfully, today's no typical day. The program is called Laugh Out Loud Hemodialysis, LOLHD for short. LOLHD is a laughter therapy program designed for kidney dialysis patients. This pilot program has been offered at Satellite Sacramento and Vallejo centers. While laughter therapy has been used as a method to cope with other diseases, Satellite is the first healthcare company in the U.S. to bring this innovation to patients with kidney disease. Laughter therapy is actually a very intentional first pilot program for us in our bigger picture to humanize dialysis. If we can make this experience of having to undergo dialysis three times a week happier, more relaxed, more about us as people, that will be progress. Satellite's laughter therapy program brings together elements of laughter, activity, meditation, and deep breathing exercises. It begins with intentional or forced laughter combined with simple exercise. The smiles, giggles, and spontaneous laughter that follow result in better moods and decreased anxiety. According to studies, the benefits of LOL therapy and other disease models include mental, physiological, and social benefits. Tina Miller, a late-stage cancer survivor, now laughter therapist, knows this firsthand. The first year I was diagnosed, I had over 12 operations. And for nine years, I had a major operation every year. And then I got into doing laughter yoga. And the surgeries stopped. No. No. The biochemistry of happiness. If you can plug into that, you're going to lessen the stress. You're going to lessen that inflammation. Your circulation is going to open up more efficiently. Laughter therapy opens up the lungs, increases physical activity, encourages social interaction, and helps patients relax. I think it's important to give patients more, give them something more than just the dialysis part of it. Give them skills, coping skills, self-management skills, laughter skills, I mean, things for them to really get through some of these really hard days. I am happy. I am happy. I am strong. I am strong. What happened here today is reaching a population that really needs some laughter in their life, and especially in the dialysis unit while they're undergoing their treatment protocol. It's a way to lighten their load. So to bring in a laughter program that allows them to feel normal for 30 minutes is such a gift. The net result is less pain, stress and sadness, and more energy, movement, and community. It lasts the rest of the day. It's like you got energy that you didn't have. Once you do the laugh, the whole experience is just, it's awesome. It really is awesome. Brightens my day. I got you working all over. Working my hands, working my feet. I said to my lady friend, this was laugh day. I'm going to laugh a lot today. And I did. Helping the patient to feel good about themselves and really living a life as normal as possible. That's what we're hoping what laughter therapy will provide. And if it works, we're ready to laugh our way through this. <laughs>
Uh, we won't watch the video. This is an, this is Sam, who was one of the guys who will, who features in the video, and it's, the video pretty much uh, talks about how laughter therapy has brightened people's lives, changed people's lives, and, uh, and 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 what's really important, and what you see from the video, it's actually not just the laughter. The laughter is a tool, and the laughter is something that uh, that we use to get people together, but it's a lot more than that. The laughter is about community, it's about patients seeing each other laughing, it's about patients seeing the staff laughing, the staff laughing with the patients. Now, you might say, well, we have a good time in our dialysis clinic, and most people do, and most people try and have a bit of a laugh with other, but if you do 30 minutes of intentional laughing, and it basically just break down a lot of this. So we get this wellness, and that's why people call it laughter wellness or cut laughter yoga, because you do get this wellness happening in your in your dialysis clinic. You get this this community, this this group um, of, of people who are doing the same thing, who can share something in common. And in fact, um, some of the people really come out of their shell. Next slide. What we found was that uh, on on this graph you'll see in blue, people agree. So. Um, over 60% thought that laughter had a positive impact on their mood. So these are the patients. They would recommend it. Um, they would like to know. And some had concerns. Um, about 20% had concerns, and they very similar to the 20% who who really didn't who disagreed that laughter had a, didn't have a positive impact. So very very importantly, laughter therapy isn't for every dialysis patient. And we found from my experience is that about one out of five say. Yeah, this is just not for me. But really importantly, those one out of five, although they say it's not for them, they don't want it not to be happening because they can see the benefits for those who really get into it. And you'll get three or four out of five patients who do get into it because it's just such a natural thing to do. So just because you have, might have one or two patients who don't really want to be involved, that's fine. Um, but most of will be involved. And what happens is if you can, and we've been able to do this in the past, is those who haven't been really that interested have just kept their headphones on, or we may have moved them to a chair or to an area in the clinic that may not be as, as available and open to the laughter therapists that are doing their laughter therapy. So very, very importantly, it's not for everyone. Like anything, is, is not for everyone. And exercise, again, is, is another example of, of not for everyone. Next slide, thanks. One of the fellows who, who, and this is just one example, um, uh, is, um, so Sam commented, you would have seen Sam from Sacramento on his, on his, uh, uh, it's his real name, he, the people are very happy to see each other laughing and on videos and on pictures. Um, he was, to, Sam was talking about another patient who really had really deteriorated over a period of, 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 of six months while he's on dialysis. And so this is a quote from Sam talking about this other fellow. So he doesn't have any family, yet he was able to laugh and actually saw, he saw huge changes in him. The biggest smile on him and even other patients around him commented about the changes. They said, have you seen him? Look at his smile. I mean, this is as a gentleman who would come in just do his dialysis, basically sleep the whole treatment. So he, this other patient had this beautiful laugh. He was just so out there and, and he said, uh, quote unquote, it, it's changed his life. Next slide. Not only do we, we use laughter therapists and they develop relationships with patients and staff, but we also um, have education posters. We have laughter lotion. Uh, we have all sorts of things to in ensure that this is encouraged. And similarly, I think in, in with a laughter therapy program, you're not gonna you're not gonna be laughing for the whole year. What I like to compare it to maybe is like a football season where you might have uh, 10 or 12 weeks of laughter therapy and you might have a break and then you might come back again. So people um, don't get too bored of it, then they but they really look forward to the next season of, of laughter therapy. Next slide. I know we've had a few glitches and we had a few issues, but I'm um, very happy if, if any of the exercise or laughter work you think might be able to uh, to be in your clinic, very happy to, for you to email me on that email or get in contact with me through the AKKF. Next slide. I was very lucky to, and I would recommend for anyone who can, is to go to um, 
to Bhutan, where um, first of all, um, their dialysis services are developing. But very interestingly, Bhutan, people actually say, well, Bhutan's the happiest place in the world. Well, it's actually not the happiest place in the world. But what they do is they measure. They don't measure their gross domestic product. They measure their GNH or their gross national happiness. And it's a very complex uh, metric of, of different uh, of, of different measurements that, that, that create this GNH and they track that over the time. And um, the constitution or the legal code in Bhutan in 1979, in 1729, I apologize, um, said that if the government cannot create happiness or social harmony for its people, there is no purpose for the government to exist. And that's still enshrined in the legal code. Uh, click please. Now I would propose that from what we've shown today and what you do every day as nephrology providers, if we can't create improvements for our people, dialysis patients, then really there's no purpose for us to exist. Next slide. So although we had issues with the videos and we apologise for that, we've also talked about an unhappiness of people, the inactivity of people on dialysis, laughter therapy as a physical exercise but also as a wellness exercise, the forms of laughter, laughter and dialysis and a little bit about LOLHD. I think that's about it, so thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Bennett. Um, for joining us and leading such an excellent webinar. Um, just for our audience, we will put a clean copy of the recording, the video, and the slides on our website um, in a couple of days so that you'll be able to access that. Um, we did have some technical issues, but we appreciate you all rejoining us and hanging in there with us. Um, our next webinar will be held in August, um, but I'll give you details for that after. Um, but um, we do have a couple of questions for you, Dr. Bennett, um, that we'd like for you to weigh in on. Okay. Um, based on your experience and research, why do people with ESRD have lower physical capacity, lower energy to do physical activity than people with other chronic diseases? That's what you referenced in slide nine. Yeah, sure. Um, there, that was uh, from another paper, um, and so, but I can put it down. So, um, and I think potentially most of the nephrology uh, uh, professionals out there um, uh, could answer that in relation to their anemia, their uremic state. So there are the physical side of things. There's also uh, that fact that they have to sit on dialysis, and they're, they're uh, you know, they're very, they're very still, um, and the fact that they don't have uh, the ability to, to, or they don't want to go out socially as well. I think, um, however, um, what, the, what they want, and, and we've done surveys on, do patients want to exercise? And we found that probably 50 to 60% do want to exercise. They just don't know how to go about it. And, and the important thing is, is that we try and get the resources to help them. Uh, to physically exercise because we do all great things in dialysis clinics. We clean their blood, we do great KTO of these, get rid of their ure, urea, we do great work with educating them on, on diet, nutrition, we support them from a social work percent, we have, we have great nephrologists, we have great nurses and technicians. The problem is, is that we don't have exercise professionals to assist this group and without those exercise professionals it's very hard for us to do that. So there are various reasons. Uh, but the fact that, that they're so inactive because of dialysis, they feel terrible after dialysis. Often we try and clean their blood in four hours um, when it's happening for 24 hours a day in, in our clinic. We try to rip you know, three or four kilograms off uh, fluid in, in three or four hours so they get this dialysis-related fatigue um, you know, after dialysis. So there are all sorts of, of reasons and, and I don't think one, one reason would fit everyone and it's different for everyone. But this external encouragement, I think, to physically uh, actively exercise, which we all need um, as a group, um, is important. And as a group, on dialysis is often a very good time to exercise and I would encourage anyone with 
an exercise background or connections with exercise people to potentially link up a, an exercise professional with their dialysis clinic because people do actually want a dialysis, they want to exercise on dialysis, they get bored, uh, they have enough of the TV and, and, it, and I've seen it, it, it happen in, in reality. That leads me to the next question. What kind of special training is needed to lead these exercises? From a physical perspective, um, you really need to be an exercise professional. Uh, the, the, there's probably, I'm aware of eight to 10 um, programs in the world that have successfully sustained exercise programs over a period of, of, of six months to a year. Um, Canada, Singapore, um, uh, there's German the groups, there's some Portuguese groups, there's some South American groups, there's some Australian and New Zealand groups. And the one thing, the one element is that they do have, they're committed to having an exercise professional come in at least once or twice per week to assist with, with the exercise because busy nurses and busy technicians and busy nephrologists, we don't have the skills, we don't have, have the expertise to do this. So we can't do this without uh, exercise professionals. That's the one element that I think is the most important. So do the patients do laxer therapy three times per week each? It depends. So you can have different models. Um, the model we had in Australia is that we did it three times per week. We did it every dialysis for a month and we changed things up and put different exercises in. The model we had in the US, uh, we did it once per week over three months. So uh, in, in Sacramento Dialysis Clinic, we had uh, uh, dialysis, we had, sorry, Laughter Friday or Fun Friday. Uh, they already had a Fun Friday where you do different themes but in Dress Up, but we, we inserted Laughter Therapy into the Fun Friday. In Vallejo, where we tried, we had our first pilot study, uh, we had we did it on a Wednesday and a Thursday, um, which you probably wouldn't want to do it on the Monday and Tuesday because that's when patients are a little bit more fluid overloaded and, and more likely to not want to do anything. So we chose the Wednesday, Thursday um, uh, shifts. And we did all three shifts. Generally the late or the evening shifts or the late afternoon shifts, some of those patients uh, have, have either worked or are a little tired. And it definitely worked better with the morning and the early afternoon shifts than the later shifts. So are there health concerns, safety concerns one should be aware of in participating in physical exercise or laughter therapy during dialysis sessions? Yes, yeah, so safety is an interesting thing and I think that my overall comment on that is that we're being unsafe by not providing any resources for exercise. So we are allowing these patients to deteriorate and I feel very strongly, you can probably hear my voice, that by letting them, these patients, um, you know, come in one year, they're walking in and then five years later they're being wheeled in and out um, on the gurney, you know, going back and forth in, in the, in the uh, ambulance. So this doesn't need to happen and, and it is, and with my with experience as a manager in dialysis for 20 years, I, I just feel that it's not it's not something that we're offering and we should be offering this. We offer great social work and, and, and uh, dietetic support, but we don't offer anything to for their physical health. So as far as that goes, um, I think that um, it, it's, it's just vital that, 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 we, that we, we do something. Not sure if that answered your question, Melanie. Oh, it's great. So you mentioned a lot of the different cultures um, that have been involved. How do you tailor the laughter therapies to accommodate culture? So as long as they understand, as long as people, and particularly in, in the California region um, where we have uh, multicultural areas and particularly down in, in our southern states as well where we have clinics um, and a high Spanish speaking population, um, but any person who doesn't speak English, as long as they understand in their own language that, that uh, the laughter therapy is a therapy that's for their benefit, it's supported by their nephrologist, it's supported by uh, the, the provider that, 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 that provides them uh, dialysis. So it's, it's vital that they have that understanding and once they have that understanding um, then they'll, they'll fit in, they'll fit in. It, it, this, this crosses cultural and, uh, and, uh, and language barriers because everyone can laugh. 
But as we certainly have seen people thinking, well, what is this all about, who haven't understood it and have thought that the people were laughing at them. And once they had explained to them that, no, this laughter therapy can open up their lungs, can make them feel better, can give them a new sense, they can go home and do it if they're anxious or, or depressed. And, and, and so these are the sorts of, of messages that, that we're giving to them. So it's providing them some more skills and some laughter skills, sort of some self-management skills um, to assist them in their, their lives going forward. I didn't, answer your pre so I didn't answer your previous question about the safety. Over that period of time, um, we had, we've had a venous alarm, one venous alarm for a patient who's been um, moving their arm around. But apart from that, we've had no central line alarms. We've had no people falling over. We've had no people coughing too much. Um, and and so, so as far as safety goes with our, uh, our sort of experience in three separate um, clinics uh, over a seven month period, we, we've really had no safety issues. Okay, thank you. Um, here's a question from um, our audience. It reads, I've heard also studies of cardiac benefits of laughter. I would also assume that the relationship between the staff and the patients with the laughter therapy improved or strengthened. So I'll answer the first bit of that question first. So there have been some studies in the cardiac benefits of laughter, laughter and they certainly are positive. The challenge with laughter um, research is that it's very difficult to, to get funding for large uh, randomised controlled trials because it isn't a drug, it isn't seen as being something important and that's a challenge that we have. But certainly if you, uh, if you Googled in and if you um, looked up some of the literature that we didn't have time to go through in detail, there's certainly cardiovascular benefits with, with blood pressure. Uh, uh, with, with, with improvement from, from myocard myocardial infarction. So there are uh, some, there are some, certainly some work done out there. Pro the, Professor Burke um, from Southern California, BERK, if you put in his name, he's one of the leaders in the world of that. Um, as far as relationships in, in, in your second question, relationships and, and rapport within, within the dialysis clinic, unfortunately you didn't see the videos, but you would have seen that, that that's incredibly improved in, in, in different parts of, uh, in, in, in our experience. The patients see other sides of the staff and the staff actually see other sides of the patient. One of the patients uh, in the video actually talked about his lady friend and his, his lady friend says how, you know, it's, it's wonderful and he said this is wonderful what we're doing in our, in our dialysis clinic, we're doing this thing and, and actually hardly any of the staff knew he had a lady friend, which was quite interesting. So, so there's various, um, there's various things that, that occur and, and again, laughter is just the tool but it's the wellness and the getting together and the shared understanding that, that we all like to laugh um, that helps further this sort of community and this, this wellness togetherness. Okay, we have quite a few questions, so I'd love to try to get through all of them. Um, here's one, it says, will, laughter, will a laughter therapist teach the dialysis staff uh, how to continue the laughter therapy and how does a clinic access access all of the exercise tools for the patients? Or how do they get that laughter therapist to come to the clinic? So it's kind sure. Of a yeah, sure, so um, laughter therapists aren't free, um, but they're not incredibly expensive either. <laughs> um, many people who do laughter therapy have often have had issues themselves and, and they've turned to laughter therapy to to support their own well-being, um, many cancer survivors turn to laughter therapy, for example. So um, they're around, and I mentioned in one of the slides that uh, that there are laughter therapists in in every major area of um, of America and all over the world. Um, so it's not that hard to get them through. Yes, you probably do need a bit of funding. Some may volunteer, but I. I I'm reluctant to say that because of, of, you know, people might take that in the wrong way. And certainly if the benefits are there, then I think they should get some, some reimbursement. So, but you don't need a, a lot of money. As far as, as far as teaching the staff, certainly um, some of the staff have wanted to, uh, to go on and learn. And the, it's, there are, there is a, a uh, you may 
you may think this is extraordinary, but there is a laughter online university where you can do qualifications in laughter therapy. All you need to do is Google laughter online university and you'll find the university and that has extraordinary um, resources. You can do a course, you can become a trainer and you become a certified trainer in, in laughter therapy. Not to say that you can't actually continue on with some of the exercises with your patients as you go because the staff certainly learn and because they're involved, they certainly learn what works and they listen to the patients and say, well, the deep breathing really helped me or the, the, the roller coaster laughter exercise was really great or the aloha laughter exercise was really great. So certainly um, they can continue on and they can do a formal education if they want. Okay. Um, so, uh, Dr. Bennett, you'll be pretty interested in this. We have a question from a nurse in Australia. So, as an RN in Australia, this is her question. Should I try to initiate laughter therapy myself, or should I try to find a certified laughter therapist? Uh, the second. I think um, it's important. Um, first of all, uh, it's, it takes time. Um, to do this. Um, certainly uh, um, that nurse could potentially do a laughter therapy course, but the difficulty is is, is that, you know, there are, there, there, there are different professions, there are different um, responsibilities and scope of practice that, that we have. Um, and it's important that patients see you as a professional nurse and to see you as a professional dialysis nurse, similar to they see the skills of a professional laughter therapist or a full-time laughter therapist. So um, I would advise that person to, to um, explore um, and look for a laughter therapist in their city or their town um, as a, a better way um, to do that. Uh, and, and it's, it's uh, and well, that's been my experience anyway. Okay. Um, well, I'll just make an announcement. If there are other questions, um, we will have Dr. Bennett answer those questions and respond by email. Um, and before we show the video, we'll show that in just a moment, um, I want to let you know that our next webinar will be held in August. The date and time will soon be announced. Steve Winfrey, an AKF advocate and kidney patient, will be here to share his story with his wife, Heather Winfrey, who recently surprised Steve with the news that she tested positive for a kidney donor, or to be a kidney donor for Steve. Uh, the story has gone viral, and with this webinar, uh, we hope to continue the momentum by sharing their story and discussing the importance of living donation. Um, registration will be available shortly, so check back at kidneyfund.org slash webinars for more information to register. Um, so I think we're going to go ahead and show that video. So thank you all so much for joining us, and thanks again, Dr. Bennett. Thank you.